I will be a bit more radical if you want and, uh, and try to give you a perspective of yeah, openness in general, how openness in academia exists and how it can affect other domains, the impact that you can have through openness, but also looking a bit into the future. Like what the EU and Mikael uh, have shown is basically the picture of what exists now and how can we work under this situation being as traditional and as uh, possible in the system so we, we play by the rules. Perhaps I will, uh, because I am a PhD and it's less likely that I'm fired, I can, I can be a bit more disruptive and, and be very critical because I think that one of our very important things that we have to do is not just be critical in our research fields, but be critical always and question the systems. And the systems become a reality in one way or another uh, because of a particular context. But when the context changes, it's, it's our responsibility to respond to that and, and not really just stay in the status quo. The status quo, of course, is very good for people that have the control and, and benefits from this. But it's not good as an optimum for the system. So we will play with that idea a bit. Um, so very briefly, an introduction. What are the different flavors of openness? Some examples and what can we do? Um, basically, we already introduced the event, so that's, that's all right. Uh, about me, I'm a PhD in PTU Management Engineering. But I started with all this logic of openness. Uh, working uh, in open innovation in Chile and in, in technology transfer. So I come uh, with the openness from the other side, with the openness logic from companies and um, entrepreneurs that really could benefit actually from academic openness because they could use our results. We believe that we are the only ones that are smart enough to look into these sort of papers and if the system is based on that really, the system is based on a sort of elite behind that, that is closed, it's a bubble. And it's not just a bubble um, between academics, but between particular academics that are lucky enough to have the resources to pay and be part of this bubble. So I think we, we need to be very critical with that, and, and, and that's what I will try to do. Um, well, about me, that's, that's the link to, to what I have done in the past, so I won't go in deep there and, and my research blog where I try to post some of the very silly basic results that I have so far but I hope eventually will be useful but in fact it's funny because um, I started with this logic from my masters and I even posted some assignments that I thought were interesting some reports and I posted my master thesis certainly all with Creative Commons and, and some things that I have done so far and, and, and funnily enough People do contact me, and people do use that content. And I have hundreds of visits in the blog every month, which is not a lot, but it's still. Um, and probably it will get much more impact than all the papers that I could produce in a closed model. And, and this is, it looks very silly, but really, even an assignment that I did in my master's, um, and a tweet, well, that I tweeted, because it was in the, plot, in, in, the, in the blog, actually allowed me to get in touch with NESTA, the National Endowment for Science, Technology, and the Arts, and eventually got me a job with them to do kind of a follow-up of this report that I did on my own, and they wanted to do from the perspective of the company. Uh, these crazy things can happen when you operate in the open, and I think it's really interesting. It's truly, really interesting. Um, so we need to think, what are these enablers that, that, that takes us to the situation where we are today, that we are questioning why we're close and why we want to get open? Um, first, this decreasing transactional costs and decreasing collaborative costs or, or, or the, the cost of doing collaboration. So now it's, it's extremely cheap to, to share information and, and, and easy to get to know people that you could collaborate with and thus uh, enable it mainly by the internet, internet, but not just that, it's also a cultural change. So that makes no sense uh, in a system that is closed. So that's one thing that, that changes a lot of things. But plus, we have increased complexity and interconnectedness. So ah, the technologies and the, the research fields that we are working on 
They, they are really building over and over and over things that makes them very, very complex. And also, you, you require certain interdisciplinarity to make sense out of this complexity. So this kind of pushes the boundaries to be more open, more flexible, more permeable. Before you could afford to be in niches, in silos, nowadays it's more difficult to be on a silo. Of course, as a PhD, uh, you are, you're taken to that, that silo because of mental sake. Otherwise, you could really get crazy. Um, but, I mean, you still need to play with the boundaries. And the criticality that, that was also very important, the urgency behind this, is that we have global challenges that, that require very complex uh, approaches, so you cannot really afford closeness, and uh, huge needs in many, many senses, but very, very limited resources. So to be paying for a system that is actually pretty bad in terms of, of the possibility of sharing is not that reasonable. So what I want to put on the table is to go from a logic that is closed by default, which is the current one, that you need to question when you want to make something open, to a logic that is open by default. <laughs> to a logic that is open by default, that actually you need to question when you close something. And it's not just the paper. The, the paper is one thing. But there are many things, and we will, we will cover some of them in the, in the presentation, that are not just the traditional paper, which, yeah, that's playing by the rules, but, but we should think about what are the new means in which research can be spread and research results in particular can be spread and can impact the world in a meaningful way. Uh, so, so I really want you to set that chip into open by default. Um, and when you operate into that set, really what happens is that your workflow becomes open and it doesn't mean that you need to work more. It's just that you just switch certain workflows into other directions. And in fact, it has many, many positive things. And, uh, and it helps you to organize your own information for yourself. And in that process, uh, you're making it open. So that's just a bit the, the rationale. And uh, there is a, I don't know how many of you saw any video that was on the, on the website. Can you raise your hands just to have an idea, not because I will tell you that you didn't do your homework. All right, now, they are really, really good and uh, much like more inspirational than I could ever be. Uh, so if you want to follow up in, in this little website that I made, you can just go and, and ah, it's a kind of an hour, probably all, all the videos and they are really, really good. But there is one that is interesting because uh, that Don Tapscott talks about these principles of an open world, these four principles, but he doesn't apply that to science. So I thought, well, let's give it a, a go with science. So we have these four principles for an open world. One is collaboration. So basically, engage with, with others to co-create, to produce knowledge collaboratively. And uh, in some disciplines, that's relatively common, especially in, in, in disciplines where, like in natural sciences, you require really expensive equipment, so you cannot really not collaborate. And, and in many natural sciences, when I talk with them, they say, well, collaboration, that's a given. Um, we operate in that way. We cannot do it otherwise. Like friends of mine that work in astronomy or things like that, for them it's obvious. Of course, it always can be better because you collaborate perhaps in a very close circle, but still. But I can tell you, social sciences or more management things, you can be like nominally cooperating or collaborating with somebody because of the citation thing, co-authoring, co but really, that's not even collaboration. It's just a political arrangement to keep things peacefully. Um, so, so that's one thing that is not really default. And so far, collaboration has been established in base of a very transactional reason because of these, these assets that are behind. Another thing is sharing. So sharing is kind of less than collaboration if you want to put it in that way because you're just you have resources many times these assets can be distributed without any cost for you it's just the logic of permanently sharing those, ac those, those assets and those assets can be databases of course your papers uh, it can be something that you have a thought in your mind and you put it in your blog and that's a very good way of sharing because you also receive feedback and people build on top of that and then you can build on top of 
others, you can elaborate uh, uh, things that are much more complex than what you could ever do. Then transparency. Um, transparency can be applied in, in many ways, but some of the, the, the issues, uh, again, in social sciences, but also in natural sciences. In social sciences, you cannot prove something to be true or false, really. I mean, it's a, it's a dialectic process. And then you go and do a survey, uh, and you analyze this thing, but you don't even show the database behind it. So you could lie like, in an incredible manner, and that's why research ethics are important. But besides research ethics, like, even if you have done the right thing in terms of you, you are not lying, but your analysis might be wrong, how can others really see what you have done and, and question it properly? Uh, we can, have come to believe that the peer review process is so powerful and that everything will be detected there. That's not really true. Like the peer review process is a validation of basic things, but it's far from being comprehensive. And many, many things in social sciences, when you go over time and review things that perhaps 10 years ago or things like that, that you have the, the benefit of time, you realize uh, they are wrong in many ways. So especially for social sciences, but not just for social sciences, transparency is a very important thing. Why is it in natural sciences it's not that much the case? Because you can prove an experiment to be wrong. But you need to, to spend loads of money to do that. And sometimes you don't have access to equipment that allows you to prove something wrong. But eventually, over time, it will be proven wrong if that's the case. But you can accelerate knowledge production and, and, and just uh, the, the whole logic of science if you are transparent. And that's why that's important. Of course, it's related with, with sharing, but not just. And then empowerment, like just believing that things can be bottom up, uh, that you don't need an institutional agreement, or you don't need uh, all uh, these kind of uh, very well known uh, people in the editorial boards and stuff in order to change stuff. You can empower yourself. Um, so, but first we need to batch some of the old paradigms. And, uh, here are a couple of things. They are not just the only things, but a couple of things that are really powerful and that create the perfect environment for this closeness. One is uh, what the proxy scheme. And this is just one one uh, picture. It's not really representing exactly what I wanted to show, but it's just the idea that we have established this system and we just take the system as it is, while it could be better. It could be way better. Uh, and here we just talk about, okay, uh, the whole system is based on this citation, and it's based on, on these very hierarchical layers, but um, why the paper should be in the format that it is? Shouldn't we question this? Uh, the, the journal as, a, as an entity was created in a world that was with paper and you had to distribute something. And, and you had an, an editorial process that was actually putting together pieces of paper. Uh, nowadays, that makes less sense. So we could even question the whole system as a whole and, and just think and dream in ways where you distribute snippets of results, for example, that are citable. Uh, and that's not sort of craziness. I mean, the world changed once but when, when, between before journals and after journals. And the journal was an incredible advancement. Of course it was. It was in a, on, a, on a world where actual, actually people encrypted research results and shared the encrypted uh, version of the, uh, the, the research result to others and only revealed this years and years after just to prove they were right. Crazy things like that happened before the journal. So the so journal was an incredible level of openness, but it can be, it can be better. And then all this issue of, of intellectual property. And with intellectual property, many of you perhaps don't really get into the issue of patents, but some of you might. And um, in, in any case, the logic of intellectual property that we have adopted as a university has to do a lot with the logic that companies have adopted. We have been sold the model that is the traditional model of taking intellectual property, very transactional, and very close 
and trying just to extract money out of the intellectual property. While we exist as an institution, we exist in, in, in the position that we, we have as creators of knowledge, not for the sake of creating money out of it. The companies have that as a mission, not, not ourselves. Um, and I, I will go back to this thing with the patents with, with one example afterwards. So in this world of openness, in this kind of uh, dreamland, that in, in some pockets it does exist, but it's not uh, the common thing. We have uh, uh, on one extreme here kind of all the logic of science in itself and openness in the context of science. But then we move along the line and we get to more of the industry side. Okay, so we have in this spectrum things like open access that was pretty well covered just before, but also open data, which is not exactly the same. With open data, you are freeing the resource just that made possible in some cases the publication, but it's the actual database that you perhaps, or whatever form that your raw data is. And you're making that available in order for others to elaborate on top of that. And in many cases, the value, the real value of what you have done is in your original data set. It's valid for social sciences and for natural sciences, like the experiment, the, the experiment that allows you to get where you are. It's what you spend, what, 80% of the time in many cases, easily? And then you write down that somehow? And the thing that is closer to be truth is that. Then you interpret reality and you put on top your theoretical approach. But what is closer to be reality is that, raw data. So it's, it's very, very powerful. And loads of people could do more with that. And of course, we have this logic of competition. So, ah, uh, if I free this thing, he will bribe before I and this thing won't, won't work. But actually, in many cases, it has been proven that the best approach is to free it because then you collaborate and then you create much more. And people actually can cite your database. The problem is how we're measuring in academia this is mm. a totally different thing. But if we think about a new system, this system should include as a very important thing the metrics that are these, these bits of knowledge that don't need to be on just a paper. But this is dreaming a bit, but all right, we need to dream. Uh, so that's open data. Then, of course, you have open innovation, which is the logic of companies um, just wanting to say, okay, I have these needs, and I want to make actually public these needs, and I also have these intellectual assets, and I free the assets in some cases for, for, us, for others to use, or I license it as, in a very open manner. And that's very good. And in fact, the surprising thing is that all the greeting companies included, it still takes them to a much more open space than academia, which is kind of weird uh, in many, many ways. Um, so that's, that's kind of the spectrum on, on that side. So, of course, we have science commons. That is basically creative commons uh, adapted to science, which is just this logic of facilitating all these intellectual property issues in a, in a way that, that makes it more approachable. So you save all the lawyers and negotiations in very standard agreements and things like that. Of course, open source, most of you know very well that, but this is, is, is a really interesting part of the open movement, that something that everybody will always acknowledge as, as one of the initiators. And we need to think why open source, why uh, in, in, in informatics they are so much more advanced. And well, of course, it's the nature of what they do, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, try to emulate what they discovered to be so powerful. Then, of course, you have um, Creative Commons that was relatively uh, also covered uh, directly and indirectly. Um, and you can very easily look up for that more information. And you have Open Design, which is kind of open source for hardware, kind of open source for material things. And that's a new revolution that is coming on the way. And I think universities have an impressive, like, really important mission there in terms of when. Uh, people especially in mechanical engineering, but also in chemistry, in, in many fields that you produce models of things, you free the blueprints, if you want, of these things and allow others to play with that. And uh, there are loads of things, but yeah. Small trademark logo, the open source. 
Yeah, yeah, I didn't. Yeah. I actually wanted to look for. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. And I, I wanted to look up for an image that didn't have the TM. But ultimately, it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, it's just to recognize that somebody trademarked that. But I am, I'm not against intellectual property in that way. I think it's fair enough. If you want to have a brand and then you want to profit for, from that somehow, or you just want to protect it so others don't copy and use it improperly, that, that can be fair game. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a good point. In fact, it, it did cross my mind too. Um, okay. Ah, I see. Okay, there you go. So um, here I will see some examples of things that are interesting in this open science space. One, open notebook science is basically the logic of, okay, especially when I do experiments, um, uh, things that are experimental, even in, in social sciences, you can have a log of what you're doing and share this log. Why is important? Because basically you're enabling others to save mistakes and to build on top of your methodology, but not methodology as you write it on a paper. Papers are ideal world methodologies. If, if the world were like what you write in your methodology, uh, things will be incredibly shorter and we will be all geniuses in fact but no like we know that things don't happen like what you describe in methodology because we try one thing it fails we try another thing it fails and eventually you find something that works and you somehow write that as a coherent methodology but if if you could prevent failure then that would be really nice and in fact well the, there are different examples but in chemistry is, is more common where you detail exactly what you did, what you mix, and, and then others can follow that and comment. And it's really, really just impressive uh, example of open science. Then all this kind of crowdsourcing in science, it does exist. There are experiments where you just free loads of resources and you create a platform where people can actually um, produce for you. I will say, ah, okay, why will they do that? But basically, in, in uh, citizen si science, how, how it is called in some cases, you can just uh, let people identify uh, galaxies, tag them, and things like that. And you can be creative and think, how could we do something similar? Uh, of course, it, it's not always the case for everyone. But it can, it, you can find things like that. And it's not only for citizens. It can be also between scientists. And if you free these things, people could actually also publish on the, uh, with you and, and they might have those sort of incentives. And so I already covered a bit of citizen science and open education is really not necessarily open science, but it's a revolution that is coming too and it's hand on hand in terms of requiring access to the knowledge. Like open education really will work properly when we have open access because it's expensive to buy all the licenses in order to produce open education. But if you have amounts of knowledge piled there that you can just put in and, and make classes with them, that really facilitates open education. And, and, and well, Coursera and a number of other things are, are just picking up so fast. And it's just incredible. It's a bit of an experiment. Um, so there are other examples of open science. Um, the Green Exchange, basically they work with uh, uh, Creative Commons and in particular Science Commons to produce a sort of framework to, in this case, share IP under a logic that is more collaboratively and, and, and makes things easier. Then you have a uh, Neuro Commons project that is also about sharing all these resources, in, in this case in neuroscience in a way that you can build on top, and it's a lot of open data, but also open access and, and so on. Uh, plus, it was already mentioned, it's just this platform for gold open access that is very comprehensive and is trying to be disruptive in this space. Uh, this is the, the blog that I already mentioned before with the open notebook science. And um, then you have uh, this, the, over there, the first scientific video journal, Jove, and there are others um, that is basically saying, is it really a paper, the best way to share this knowledge? Why don't we use video, for example, or, or more graphical approaches? 
in many cases, it's just trying to put in words what you're trying to do is silly. It takes forever and uh, is not very good anyway. So we need to start thinking about these, these sort of issues. What, what is the best way of distributing? And they are starting to actually, the, there are journals that are for video, and you can cite and everything, and it works. And it's not in every discipline. It's more kind of into things that are experimental, but still. Um, it is uh, something that we need to, to be looking at. And here, uh, something that I want to, to just uh, cover briefly, this, this side. One thing is open access, and, and that's very important, but also the review process is something we should be aware of that could be way better. Um, uh, closeness in the review process is not good for everyone. Um, it's, it's something that can be better, and we have tried this approach in uh, the commerce space, and it works incredibly well. Platforms like eBay and Amazon work because they create trust through reviews. And it's not just one review, it's like hundreds of reviews for, per product in some cases. And that creates a reliable way in which you measure what is behind the quality. And of course you could have in these schemes people that is professional alongside people and, and paid perhaps to do this kind of job, alongside hundreds of readers. And in this case you could even dream a bit more. Why a paper should be a PDF? Why shouldn't be something that if I found something in the paper that doesn't make sense to me, I cannot comment in line and I can start having a debate. In many, many of the blogs that I read at least, bah, when I read the article, it's interesting, but when I read the comments, it's where I really get uh, a good impression of what's going on. And uh, I really would like to see in science that, of course, in some fields that happens, that there are some blogs and things that are well-respected and there are good debates there. But for the most part, when it comes to papers, you cannot do much. You find something that is wrong, and you just note it, write it down over your paper, and that stays there forever. And also, the author might realize that he made a mistake, and he might want to update. In the paper traditional work, to update that is a mess. Or you need to what, republish, write another article somehow. That, that's really silly in many ways. So very quickly, open innovation this logic of having this, this technology needs and, and just approaching uh, researchers to solve it. Uh, that's a typical traditional technology transfer pipeline. I won't go into details because it's, it's not the case necessarily and we don't have that much time, but it's just the case that we see this thing of uh, producing this intellectual property in the form of patents most of the time uh, as a thing that kind of uh, works a bit like a pipeline where you have research funding, you have the research center, you have a scientific discovery, this might lead to a scientific publication, but if it has value, on parallel you play with the patent, and the patent can uh, be, uh, you, you can do all this uh, thing that is also very complicated and very expensive in order to be able to patent, that can take years, a couple of years, no problem, and then uh, try to sell this patent somehow or make use of it. But then you lock up this knowledge and you create a monopoly for that knowledge. Problem being that many times that patent is never sold because university is really not good for uh, really selling intellectual property or making use of the intellectual property properly. Um, so basically you just lock up the knowledge in a folder and you create this monopoly in it. And of course a company might still anyway do it because they have better lawyers. So they can work around a patent uh, in, in many cases. And then you have this new logic of open innovation that tries to pull things from universities, but we are still in this funny world where uh, they are connecting in different sites. So the university tries to sell something that is already packaged, and the, the industry tries to look for something that is more custom-made. So we are living in this world where one is pushing, one is pulling, but never founding themselves in the middle. Of course, there are exceptions, but... So it looks a bit like that. Everybody just shooting each other, but not in the right spot, not never, never really getting to the middle. And, and it's just the whole idea of going from research to development and from development to research in a more fluid manner. Uh, I won't go into, into this, but you, have the, this, you will have the slides. And you have these thousands and thousands of, of needs that, that can be 
can be seen online for free and it could be really interesting inputs for your own research when you're looking for a research impulse uh, well there, there is there are databases of needs um, a quick intellectual property discussion so DTU owns roughly 200 patents that's what is stated in the in the website uh, patents last usually 20 years and they cost money to be maintained and cost money to be registered. Uh, the estimation is that it's anywhere between $100,000 and $200,000. Of course, sometimes that money is paid in full by DTU, sometimes it's paid by a sponsor, sometimes can have a grant, but it's still money that somewhere needs to come, that, that money. Uh, the, if Just by making a quick math, then the patent portfolio could easily be $30 million at DTU. And uh, that in terms of, of uh, compared to the total income minus expenses in 2011, is 14 million US dollars. So twice the income of, uh, or if you want two years of income from DTU, is the portfolio of patents that we have. Good question is, does it make sense? Or will it be better that it's open and actually the SMEs in Denmark can access that for free? Uh, it, it, I think it's just a good debate to have in terms of what is the impact that you can have through knowledge. Valid for open access in terms of publication, valid for patents too. Um, and it's something you need to question a bit more. These are examples of open design. Open design is this kind of thing contrary to, to patents and saying, all right, it will just free the resources of how to make things happen and will let others build on top and I, I will be a sort of platform. And I, I might profit from being a platform. That's, that's all right. So there are some examples, nice examples are Arduino, some of you might have heard. Um, interesting way of just opening up this, this as a platform to produce microprocessors and, and components of, of uh, these boards. Uh, and plus RepRap, this, this uh, first 3D printing machine that can print itself other 3D printing machines. And that was done also totally open open design, which is, is very interesting. Uh, an interesting case also uh, in one of the videos that I, I put online, this open source ecology, that is basically uh, somebody that decided that there are certain machines that are really important for civilization, if you want, and they should be open uh, knowledge in order to produce them and for, for example, people in Africa to be able to build their own tractors for 10% or 1% of the cost of a real tractor and be able to maintain and create an economy out of that. Uh, Thingiverse, uh, where you just post loads of your 3D models and other people can build on it and, and just create more and more complex stuff. And in many cases, some of you might create 3D models and they could be used and reused in many different ways. And there are some, of course, good tools and resources you can go into. I, there is the Open Science uh, Directory, Wikispaces. That basically, if you want to do a wiki for your project, it's, it's free. And uh, of course, it has a learning curve as everything, but it's pretty simple, really. Uh, Gapminder, which is just one example of what happens when you put loads of data and a tool to exploit it. And then you can visualize, in, in, with, in the case of Gapminder, all this very complex economical data in an incredibly simple manner. And, do correlation with whatever. Um, WordPress, just for you put your blog in, and, and very, very simple. Mendeley, perhaps it's a funny example in this context, but it's, it's not that much, because basically if one, one thing is that you make your references very transparent, all your things that you have in terms of uh, the literature you're using, so you can share your findings in terms of what is what you're reading uh, with others and in a very public manner, but also they are trying to build a new metric system for publication. So you can actually detect readers of papers, not just citations, which is really nice, and detect other things like demographics behind, which are the universities that are accessing your papers. There's a whole load of things behind something like Mendeley that have impressive implications. Well, from Alpha, similar to the case of Gapminder, but uh, yeah, building a platform where you just tap into the databases that are open. And just to wrap up, like this is a debate, and we saw it in, in other slides, that is not just we are worried. This is a very hot topic, and particularly hot these last two years. Uh, and, and we encourage you to just look more into it. It's not about like a bunch of communists just want to make everything free and don't believe in markets. It's actually the opposite. We, 
I think we believe in markets. It's just that we also believe that there are things that are nonsensical, that are just not good markets. And uh, I was just too close now with a with a friend actually yesterday in in Tivoli, just having a beer and discussing this thing. A PhD friend from ours, and I was trying to explain this with example of of the music uh, industry, but. Actually, I, I thought the example, and I will wrap up that with uh, Amazon and using that analogy. So let's imagine a world where we have um, sort of Amazon that has loads of product in it. But first, in order to see what they have in it, you need to pay. So you want to buy a bicycle or a book, whatever, you need to pay to access this database of what is inside Amazon. First thing. Second thing, uh, if you want to buy something, you need to buy um, sort of subscription that allows you to have kind of a buffet uh, assortment of these things. But of course, you have limited time, so you cannot download unlimited paper, uh, unlimited uh, uh, books or whatever is the case. So in in reality, you just have just bit of this buffet. But then in the same world, the weird thing is that everything is paid by the government. Everything that is inside Amazon is already paid by the government to be produced. So companies are paid to produce things to be put in Amazon. Uh, and then they don't get any money when something is sold on Amazon. So I am a company that produces bicycles. I'm paid by the government to do that. I put it on Amazon, and uh, when the bicycle is sold, I get nothing because I was already paid anyway. So why would I get something? And then, in this very weird, strange world, uh, this Amazon still exists, and uh, he says that basically he is very important because somebody needs to hold this platform where you go and access this thing. It's an incredibly important thing. Um, and they say that basically also they, they review the items, so they, they do the curation of the articles. Um, but they don't think that people could do the curation themselves. So any, anything close to that outside academia won't be tolerated. And that, that will be totally absurd. But we keep it because we are kind of a small world with uh, rules that are self-contained and people that is not very revolutionary. Uh, I invite you to be a bit more revolutionary, to be a bit more radical, and we should be more critical. That's it. <laughs>